My name is Glenn McEwen. I am the Interim General Counsel at Argonne National Laboratory, uh, the Technology Commercialization and Partnership Division and the Law Department are hosting today's Intellectual Property Symposium. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend today's program. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, today's program is going to be recorded, so I hope that doesn't uh, uh, discourage anyone from asking, asking any questions uh, during the course of the program. Under the contract that um, governs the operation of this laboratory between New Chicago Argonne LLC, uh, the contractor for the lab, and the U.S. Department of Energy, technology transfer is a mission of the laboratory. In the, uh, the statement of work for the, uh, in the prime contract, uh, it states that the contractor shall contribute to U.S. technological competitiveness through research and development partnerships with industry that capitalize on the contractor's expertise and facilities. And cooperation with industrial partners may include long-term strategic partnerships aimed at commercialization of laboratory inventions or the improvement of industrial products. Now, the capabilities that exist within TCP as and the legal department are really designed to assist the laboratory in fulfilling its technology transfer mission. And in the legal department, we have three attorneys and two paralegals whose work is principally devoted to this mission. Three of our attorneys, Mark Languth, Mark Hilliard, and Pete Sloniak, will be participating in today's program. I hope you find the symposium instructive. I hope you come away with a greater understanding of laboratory processes for protecting and developing intellectual property, as well as an appreciation for the opportunities that arise from external research collaboration. I will hand uh, the podium over to the co-host of the symposium, Shares Sundarajan, for his comments on today's program. Uh, thanks very much, Glenn. I, I appreciate that. Very, um, and, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for taking the time. Um, I'd like to join Glenn and welcome you, you to this uh, uh, annual IP symposium, the 2017 edition. <laughs> um, we've got a fairly packed agenda. Uh, we've tried to be time efficient, uh, but at the same time, try to give you as much information and give you the opportunity to ask us questions uh, and ask experts questions uh, you know, that we have uh, invited to join us. Uh, so just to give you a very quick run through over what we plan to do over the next uh, about three hours, uh, we, we plan to have a, a brief discussion with one of the leading inventors at the lab, Jeff Elam, uh, talk a little bit about his experience uh, with inventing, with the whole uh, patent filing prosecution process, with the licensing process. It's a great opportunity for you to ask questions of someone that has been there and done that in a lot of different ways and continues to do uh, extremely well in that regards. Um, we have, uh, towards the end of the session, a, a panel discussion with you know, four of our distinguished uh, scientists who have gone on in some various ways, shapes, or forms to, to kind of do entrepreneurial things here at the lab. Um, and so uh, you have an opportunity to talk about that. If, if entrepreneurship is of interest, uh, what can we do? What is more challenging? How does one go about doing this is something that that panel will, will speak a lot about. And in between that, we have a little bit of a discussion around patent basics um, and uh, some discussions around you know, how we engage with companies, particularly in this current climate, foreign companies, foreign entities. Who are they and how do we efficiently work with them given our, you know, who we are as an entity, a, a U.S. Department of Energy uh, federally funded research and development center. Uh, so, so given that, you know, that, that's the context. And then last but not least, and I should mention this for sure, uh, one of our agenda items is really focused around, you know, some of the centers that have been recently created at Argonne. Uh, they've been around, some, some of you may have run into, Access. Uh, which is our uh, Center for Collaborative Energy Storage Solutions. Some of you may have uh, run into Argonne Design Works or the National Security Program Office. Uh, Brad Ulrich will spend a little bit of time telling you about why we created these centers, what is their purpose, and how they fit. 
Um, at any point during this, please do ask questions. Uh, you know, I, I think that if we can keep this informative and useful to you, that's you know, in, in everyone's best interest. So, um, so that's that's uh, that's my request, and uh, thanks again for coming. Uh, before I get started, I actually uh, thought that uh, you know the, the introduction might be best uh, served by actually uh, listening to a brief snippet of the, uh, Secretary Perry's address. Um, you know when he was uh, nominated and actually confirmed into this, his current role, uh, he gave a, a uh, about an hour long uh, address to the Department of Energy. Uh, this is only about 90 seconds of that, but I thought, you know, he puts it very eloquently and, you know, I, I thought this might be a good uh, clip to get us started around kind of the value of commercialization, if you will. Alex, if you don't mind. But going through this process of, of working with not only Texas A&M, but in, in the University of Texas, and knowing and learning about what you do, and the potential of what we have in front of us and, and the jewels that these national labs are gave me this incredibly new appreciation about the Department of Energy, about each of you and the, and the role that you play, the, the importance of of, of commercialization of technology, and Grace and I were talking about that and what they do at her lab. And, and, and the, I mean, think about the ability that you have and, and that, that we collectively have in, in front of us with the, with the proper management and authority and, and, and direction to literally go change the world. I mean, that's the, the, what a cool place to get to get up every day and go work at that has the potential to do that. You realize how fortunate you are to be a part of that. I mean, there are literally millions of people around the world today that would give anything to be in your shoes to be a part of something so consequential. Grace and I were talking about what happened some years ago at that facility of which she oversees that affected my home state in a powerful way. You think about what George Mitchell and that lab did together working on how do you extract this product from the earth that has been so difficult and the hydraulic fracturing literally changed the world. And the agency you work at was right at the epicenter of that. What's next? Is it in cybersecurity? Is it in supercomputing? Is it in something that even you haven't dreamed up yet? That's the, that's the exciting thing. Uh, I couldn't uh, put it any better. <laughs> so I, I thought it would be uh, best heard in, in the Secretary's own words, which I, I think very, very eloquently uh, lays out the case for commercialization as part of our mission here at the labs. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, sometimes we forget that, you know, it's, it's a, uh, technology transfer commercialization is very much part of the DOE mission and the lab's mission. Uh, it's, it's not just doing great science, absolutely that's the core, but it's doing great science and finding ways to cre create impact from the science that we do. And, that, and that, that impact part of that word is enabled by commercialization. And, and, and I mean that in the broadest sense of the word. Everything from publications uh, to patents and intellectual property for which this session is really focused on, which is really the basis for a lot of the, uh, the work that goes on ultimately in taking the technology uh, to market in some capacity. Um, Argonne has actually made some changes organizationally over the last uh, few months uh, to actually reflect a lot of the priorities that Secretary Perry talked about. And I thought I would just take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit, talk you through kind of some of these organizational changes that have been made. Um, 
You may have seen a, a fifth box show up in the org chart. Uh, that's, uh, it's hard to read, perhaps, especially if you're in the back of the room, but that's our typical org chart. So you can look it up on, on our homepage later on. Um, but this, this, uh, this box here uh, kind of showed up uh, in the February timeframe. Uh, but uh, it was really with the idea that if, you know, uh, science is a collaborative activity, right? <laughs> <laughs> and if we're going to be serious about collaboration and creating impact from the science that we do, uh, can we find ways of emphasizing and prioritizing the partnership and outreach activities that we do as a lab? Uh, so certainly uh, cross cuts across the lab, but looking beyond at other organizations, be they on the science end like universities, uh, be they industry research labs, be they industry business units, startups, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of folks in the ecosystem asso associated with taking technologies or intellectual property to market. And we'd like to be able to selectively play with all of them <laughs> as appropriate, uh, you know, in the specific case that we are looking at. Uh, so that's, that's really the, uh, the intent uh, from a lab perspective is to highlight and prioritize the importance of partnership and outreach um, in the mission of what we do as a lab. Uh, this is what the organization actually looks like. Um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of folks here might be familiar with TDC, uh, Technology Development and Commercialization. TDC as an organization, I think, has existed for 15 or 20 years. Uh, so that acronym, TDC, has been used a lot. Uh, we've actually changed that. Uh, we're, we're calling that same organization now TCP. And to help you remember, I have a little mnemonic. Uh, it is all about IP, so TCP IP for those network geeks of you <laughs> in this audience. But uh, so technology commercialization and partnerships is what TCP stands for. But effectively, it's the old TDC organization uh, with very much the same focus around helping you with, uh, you know, capturing intellectual property, working very closely with legal. Um, and then helping you to move that intellectual property into the market by identifying potential licensees, potential collaborators, and then working with you to drive those to contracts and ultimately allowing you to do your work uh, in, in the actual science and technology. Um, the communications and public affairs group, uh, formerly it was communications, educations, and public affairs. Uh, we used to call it SIPA, we still call it SIPA, but there's no E. <laughs> um, and then uh, two very important uh, groups that have, you know, we, we've kind of highlighted them. They've always existed, but perhaps not with the prominence that they have today. Uh, the strategic outreach function is our government relations organization. Uh, Norm Peterson, Sarah Higgins, and others. But we really thought it was important to, you know, to recognize that they play a key role in a lot of our aspects. And as we think about strategically looking at making partnership out and outreach activities that are you know, associated with our key initiatives, it was important for them to be a part of it. So we, we kind of created that as, a, as, a, as an organization or as a group to support that activity in a formal fashion. And then, and then last but not least is strategic operations and these centers. And I'm not going to steal Brad's thunder. I'm going to let him talk about this when he, you know, in just about an hour or so. He will, he will tell you a lot more about that organization and, and the centers and what they are purposed to do. Uh, but all of this is focused around helping us take intellectual property and move it to market uh, and do it in a way that is, you know, consistent with those three objectives. Um, so we are a Department of Energy uh, lab. In fact, we're an Office of Science sponsored lab. So as an Office of Science lab, whatever we do with other sponsors has to be synergistic with what we do with the Office of Science. That's an important part of the mission to recognize what that value is and to be able to communicate it, not only to the other sponsors, but also to the Office of Science. Uh, managing risk along the way, uh, which is the second point here, is to make sure that when we start looking at other sponsors, when we start looking at new business models, uh, by definition, we're doing things a little differently. And when we do things a little differently, uh, we want to make sure that we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. We want to explore. We just want to do it deliberately and systematically. And we want to do it in a way that is consistent with you know, the, 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 sponsor, the, the DOE sponsors' uh, requirements and, and expectations. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, there's a whole lot from a best practices perspective in terms of processes, in terms of uh, governance, et cetera, that we think we can bring to this that ultimately will result in better outcomes. Uh, so that is the purpose of this new organization that's been created as of February. Um, I'm happy to take a, you know, if there's a question or two that's burning right now, I'm happy to, happy to take it out about any of this. Any, uh, anything, I, please.
Absolutely. The intention, I, actually, it's a, it's a great question, and let me, let me hit that. So um, we're taping not, you know, just with the idea that we'd like to be able to share this internally uh, with, with staff. Uh, we probably will chunk it up is the thought process. I don't think anyone will want to sit through three hours <laughs> on a video format. Uh, but if we can do it, if we have specific areas that we think are valuable, we'll, we'll chunk it up and make it available. So that is the intention. Certainly the charts will be available. So whatever charts are used, uh, we will definitely make that available immediately. Thank you. Um, so if there's no qu oh, yes, please. Uh, that whole organization is about, um, it's about 80 people in total. Uh, Oh, good question. That's, that's, a, that's a different question. <laughs> um, we typically average about 140 to 150 invention disclosures. Um, we file probably 60 to 70 patents a year, and we get somewhere close to that number on an annual basis, but you remember that it's about a three-year time lag. Um, these, the number that we actually file, between the time that we, uh, you know, there's an invention disclosure, and, and, and Mark Hilliard will actually talk a lot about this process in a few minutes, but uh, between the invention disclosure being filed and a patent application being submitted to the USPTO, there's actually a fairly significant commitment of time and resources, particularly dollars, in creating that application and filing that application. So there is a, a decision step along the way. Our budget for filing patents is, is, uh, is limited. <laughs> and so that, that plays uh, somewhat of a role as well. But we'll, we'll talk more about this, but it's a great question. Um, if there's nothing else, I, I, I'd actually like to invite uh, Jeff Elam, uh, uh, you know, and as he's coming up, um, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, this is the formal introduction. <laughs> Jeff is senior sci uh, chemist and group leader at Argonne National Lab, where he directs a program in atomic layer deposition technology with the goal of developing new applications for ALD in fields such as photovoltaics, catalysis, batteries, lithography, and large area detectors. Uh, Jeff earned his BA in chemistry from Cornell University and his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Colorado. As a postdoc researcher at the University of Colorado, uh, Jeff developed ALD thin film growth methods. Uh, uh, Jeff has authored over 200 papers and an in, is an inventor on over 50 patents and inventions related to ALD. Uh, Jeff has won four R&D 100 awards and is heavily involved in chairing and organizing ALD sessions uh, at the ECS and the AVS. Uh, Jeff, thank you. This is a terrific. <laughs> I, I'm honored to have the opportunity to you know, ask you a few questions. Um, so thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. And <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, so we have about, we allotted about half hour, give or take, for, for this uh, initial exchange. Um, I have a few questions that were prepared just to get Jeff warmed up, uh, but I'd love to, you know, in a, you know, after a few questions, turn it over. If you have questions to ask Jeff about his process, his experience in, in becoming a prolific inventor and in, in becoming a prolific licensor of, of intellectual property and all of his experiences in that process, you know, please feel free to, 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 to jump in. I think that'll be, uh, that was the intention of this, uh, this session. Um, Jeff, uh, Jeff, maybe I could start with a uh, with a with a just a simple question as a warm up. You know, I, uh, uh, if you don't mind, you know, if you could share with the audience, you know, how long have you been at Argonne, and you know, uh, your experience, just a brief summary of what it's been like being a scientist and an inventor at Argonne. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I've been here at Argonne for. Can you hear this? Okay, for uh, uh, about 15 years now, um, and. Uh, um, I am uh, currently a senior chemist and a group leader, and so that, that's, uh, the group leader part is uh, what I attribute to the fact that we have a lot of papers and patents and so forth is because I've got about 10 people that are just fabulous and they're constantly thinking of new ideas and so forth. So, you know, it, it really is, it's my team that is uh, responsible for the, the output. Uh, also, the fact that um, the work that, that I do, that my group does is, is in uh, thin film deposition in particular, it's this atomic layer deposition, and it has uh, applications in a lot of areas, and that's a reason why it's sort of naturally patentable. I mean, I think if you're here at this meeting, then you're interested in learning more and probably in trying to patent your own research, so you, you probably have ideas about how that could happen. There is some research that goes on where maybe it's not so natural, if it's, if it's more basic in nature, um, 
so anyway, like I said, it's just the, the nature of the research that I do is such that there are a lot of potential applications for it. So, um, yeah. Thank you. That, that's sure. helpful. I mean, so so you know, you're you're in your lab or you're talking with your group, and and they uh, you know you have these ideas. How do you know when an idea is an invention? Well. You don't. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you try to, um, it's come with experience, I guess. Um, you have a, uh, an idea of, well, you know, here at Argonne, um, uh, it's not a corporation, it's a national lab, and so people are, uh, it's important to, to publish and to give presentations and so forth, so people are generally uh, well aware of the, the open literature, the, the, the the journal publications and the books and so forth about your particular field, so you, you keep up with that, and you'll know if you're doing something that's new. And uh, you know, I guess you know all all research is in some in some uh, sense new. But uh, you know, the question is, how do you know if you have an invention? Well, um, uh, it has to be something which you know is not only uh, new, but it's something which uh, is not obvious. So these are these are sort of the two. Uh, that, that's sort of one of the criteria, um, sort of formally, I guess, for uh, for patenting something. Um, so, uh, uh, if you if you have an idea that it could be uh, something patentable and might be useful, um, then uh, the thing that you need to do is that you need to talk to your supervisor. That would be the first uh, step because um, by consulting with with her or with him, uh, that's how you could probably learn more about whether this is something which has some has some viability. So, uh, like I said, it's. I don't have an easy answer for that question because it's a difficult question to answer and you might not know for several years if it's something which ultimately is going to be a patent. But if you have any inkling that it is, then talk to your supervisor. If I could just pull on that thread a little bit more. You know, you have uh, 200 plus publications, 50 plus patents. How do you decide which way to go? Do you decide to publish? Do you decide to patent? And how do you make that decision around these? Yeah, well, I think to survive in a national lab, uh, at least from my perspective anyway, you have to do both. Uh, so, um, the way it works is that uh, after you uh, disclose an invention, which means that you either, uh, you know, give a talk or you publish a paper uh, or you, you know, talk with some colleagues about an invention or, or, or some new research outside of Argonne National Laboratory, after that point in time, you have one year uh, to file uh, a patent application. And so, uh, if, if you work for a company, what they would say is, don't tell anyone, right? Of course, let's, let's file the patent, and even after we file a patent, we're still not gonna talk to anyone because we, don't, we want as few people to know about this as possible. At the National Lab, it's sort of the opposite. If people don't know about the research you're doing, then, then you can't progress in your career. So you have to give these talks and these presentations and so forth. So the idea is, in consultation, again, in consultation with your, with your supervisor, you'd wanna go ahead and, 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 and file an, an, uh, an invention report, uh, but, you know, you pursue these publications and presentations and so forth, but with, with this idea always in mind that there's, there's, there's this one-year uh, uh, deadline uh, between when you would give a talk and when you have to have that patent application submitted. I think in general you want to do it as soon as possible because um, with the with the team here, you know the um, uh, TCP and also the Argonne Legal, you want to give them as much time as possible uh, to make decisions and to take actions, right? So um, uh, uh, it can to submit a paper. It has to be a, a, a fairly complete body of work and has to be fairly well polished and so forth. Or to give a talk as well. To submit an invention report, it can be sort of half baked. Right, because you, you still have time to develop that further, but you want to know as soon as possible if this is something that that these guys are going to want you to uh, to provide information for a patent or not. So yeah, simultaneously would be good, but if you could do the invention report sooner, that's better. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And and just as I, I uh, thank you, if you just give me one second, I just have one one thing to say. Uh, please, I encourage the questions. Uh, Jeff, either one of us perhaps could repeat the question because they don't have mics and we do, and this is being taped, so they, okay. uh, we probably won't pick up their question, but we can definitely pick it up if it's on a mic. Uh, so with that, I think there were some follow-up questions. And... Okay, so the question was, uh, what do I mean by sooner in, to, in terms of um, filing an invention report versus, let's say, submitting a paper? Um, 
I would say uh, if you have, let's say, if you're an experimentalist and you have some initial experiments that are pointing in a certain direction, that would be the time that you'd want to think about filing an invention report. Um, I don't know, uh, as an experimentalist, that's my experience, right? Um, of course, you can, you can patent ideas, and, and, and so that's maybe more complex, so I don't really have any good advice there. But at least as an experimentalist, I would say, uh, if it's the first couple of experiments and they give it give it a positive result, enough that you say, hey, we're going to continue to make a full study and, and publish a paper, that would be the time to, to file the uh, invention report. Uh, I think there was another question. Yes, please. Well, my question is, you mentioned that the budget for pilot practice is limited. Um, I, I come from a small business, and I would imagine that the Uh, so yeah, so just for let me just paraphrase that question. But uh, uh, would there be uh, interest and openness from the part of the lab uh, to have a company come in and help you know pay for the patenting uh, process? And the answer is, in the right circumstances, yes. Um, so if we already have a relationship, if it's known, particularly if some sort of an option or a license agreement is either in the works or already been executed, yes. I mean, that's something that we, in fact, we, we do that quite regularly. Um, in terms of limitations of the patent budget, uh, you know, we, we are, um, uh, we do our best to be able to identify and file the applications for those that those are you know those uh, inventions that we think uh, you know add value, um, so we, we try as much as possible to not let budgeting issues be our constraint. Uh, in some ways, if you think about it, it's a key part of our commercialization process, which is part of our mission. <laughs> uh, so so um, if we do run into a situation, for example, that we, uh, we run out of money right, in the patent budget, we will you know, go back to the well, so to speak, and see if we can find other sources of income that can be repurposed for that, um, or other, purpose, you know, other sources of overhead, for example, that could be repurposed for that. Uh, in the worst case scenario, we might wait a couple of months for the next fiscal year and then have you know, some filings in the next fiscal year as the next budget kicks in and so forth. At least in my couple of years here, we haven't had the issue where our patent budget has limited us from what we've filed. Uh, hopefully that addresses the question. So, um, so, so, so Jeff, you know, you've, you've navigated this process that we have at Argon going from an invention disclosure all the way through a filed application uh, a number of times. Uh, do you have some advice for the folks here that might not have gone through that process ever? You know, are there things that you would say, do this, don't do that? <laughs> yeah, uh, let me think. So, I mean, I mean, I already made this point that, um, you know, that submitting an invention report uh, should be done early, and uh, if there's any like I said, any inkling that you, that you think that this is a valid, uh, or that this is an invention, you should go ahead and do that. And incidentally, it is a one-page form on the web, so it's very simple to do, and, and that's great that they made the barrier so low. In terms of the process that happens next, um, the next thing that happens is that there is an intellectual property discussion group, IPDG meeting. It's a meeting between the inventors, um, folks from both uh, TCP and legal, and typically the division directors sometimes, of whatever divisions are, are the inventors. Um, and at this meeting, that's your opportunity to present uh, why you think that this is something which is worth patenting, right? So you'd want to be prepared to talk about, um, you know, what need does this fulfill? Who, who, who would patent, who would license the patent if, it, if indeed it get, becomes patented? Um, you know, what's different about your invention versus previous invention? So it's, it's, uh, it's 
being a little bit of a, a salesperson, so to speak. So uh, like I said, that would be the next thing to do is to make sure that you, you know, come prepared to that meeting to, to answer these sorts of questions. Then if it is, uh, if, it is if the decision is to go ahead and file a patent application, um, again, uh, the thing that you want to do is to make sure that the outside counsel that is contracted to write and submit this patent application, that they have as much information as you can possibly give them. So any, you know, even the, a, a draft of a paper, even if it's almost an embarrassing draft, you want to make sure that they have that. You want to make sure that they have everything. If you've ever given a presentation, they should have all those slides. Um, and then uh, the next step is actually I think pretty enjoyable, which is you get to uh, work directly with this outside counsel. So they're going to they're going to contact you and say, "Hey, we have some questions. Um, can we talk on the phone or whatever?" Um, they're generally really smart people. Uh, they have to be, I guess, to try to understand a broad range of technologies, and um, you know they want you to succeed and they want this patent application to succeed. So, again, um, especially if it's something, especially if it's something you're really interested in, right? Take the time to. Uh, to give them the information that they need, uh, answer questions, um, uh, you know, clarify points, and, and so on. Um, I guess, and then finally, the last step is after it is uh, patent application is submitted, uh, at some point, the U.S. Patent Office, an examiner will 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 read it and will come back with comments. And again, that that can sometimes be a a lengthy process, but again, the more the more energy, the more effort you put into that, the better chance you have of, of ultimately getting a patent and having it be a strong one. Thank you, Jeff. That was, that was very helpful. I, I, I keep scanning. If there's questions along the way, please don't hesitate. It's, uh, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, uh, you you present uh, to your supervisor uh, some information that says, hey, I think I have a, a new invention and that we should file uh, an invention report, and, and your supervisor sits on it for a year and doesn't do anything. Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, right. Well, I, I think that you should, you know, have a a detailed discussion with your supervisor about what are their reservations and misgivings. Is it just that they're too busy and they didn't get around to it, or is they have some legitimate reason why they think that this is not worth submitting? Uh, uh, um, if I could suggest, if it's a specific case, why don't we take it offline? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because it sounds like it's a specific case. Um, so if it is a specific case, I'd be happy to make myself available and we can talk more about it um, outside of this venue. But if you have general questions around the process, uh, around you know specific milestones or what might be done, that I think this forum is probably better suited for that. Uh, yes, this question at the back. Um, sorry, the, we'll come back to this. Come back to you after. Yes, please. Uh, once there's public disclosure uh, within the U.S., yes. Uh, now there's certain foreign rights you might lose earlier, uh, right? So let me see if I understood the question correctly, that there was a disclosure, there has been some time, or there's been some disclosure, some publication. Um, can it be, uh, you know, can we revisit it at some later point in time uh, and tweak it in some way that allows us to kind of move forward? 
Uh, I'm not an attorney, uh, but there are a lot of attorneys here that are eminently qualified to answer this. Mark or Pete or Mark, I mean, would you like to, uh, to answer that? I, I think you're, you're uh... yes, Mark, please. Uh, Mark is Chief Patent Counsel, by the way, for Argon. <laughs> So if I could just repeat it for the sake of the mic here, <laughs> for the taping, um, I, you know, the, uh, what I'm taking away from what Mark just said in, in response to the question around what do we do with continuing work if there was a, some sort of a disclosure early on is that you know, th there certainly continues to be, as the work continues and as you make tweaks and turns and so forth with your research, there's new uh, ideas, new results that are, you know, that potentially benefit from subsequent patenting act activity. So my recommendation to build on what Mark just said is keep the dialogue open, you know, have the invention disclosure filed anyway and have the dialogue between legal and uh, the, the business development person in TCP. Uh, they can help you make sure that you continue to capture the value that emerges from your, from your inventions. Uh, so thank you, Mark, I appreciate the help. Uh, there was another question, yes? Um, I'm not sure I com completely understand the question, but I think what you're asking is, how do you how do you know if something is of intervention? Oh, I see what you're saying. In other words, I have let's say someone in my group has some idea, and the question is, do they invest time and resources in developing that idea so that they can make. Uh, they can make a uh, patent application about it. Okay, so there's a couple ways to go about that. First of all, we, we can't really do any work unless we have funding to do that work. So uh, we, we try to make sure that we, uh, you know, you, 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 you can't like control your own creativity, but you can at least try to direct it towards projects that you have ongoing, right? To, to justify work that you do uh, uh, to try to realize uh, uh, an invention. Also, uh, quite often, um, okay, there are these things called swift LDRDs, which are very much directed towards, I think, what you're describing. So it's uh, internal funding here at Argonne that you can apply for in order to develop an idea to the point that you might submit a patent application, right? So that would be a source of funding to do just that. Also, uh, sometimes divisions have internal resources. So you'd want to talk to your supervisor and they could, or depends on your relationship, you might talk to your division director, whatever, but you can ask them about it. Say, hey, I've got this, this great idea. I don't have a funded project to do it, but if I did, I could file a patent application and that would lead to a bigger program. 
because that's you know it's all about trying to grow argon, and so everyone would be supportive of that to the to the extent that they can. I just I wanted to get back to one uh, prior question, which was regards to you know uh, publication, or let's say uh, 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 public presentation and then patent application. So when you give a talk, you always have this uh, this option of let's say <laughs> you're. Uh, calling something compound X, right, in the talk and saying, you know, not intentionally not giving away the most important part of that um, invention. And if the talk is, you know, 15 slides long and that's something up in the corner of one slide, uh, and also if you say to the audience, look, I, I can't tell you this because we're trying to patent it, but, you know, it's, uh, then people I think are going to be understanding of that. I used to, it used to be that if I saw that in a talk, I would just kind of roll my eyes and say, like, well, what are you doing here if you can't tell us that stuff? Come on. But now I kind of understand it a little better. So as long as you approach it in that way, that it is just a small part of a much larger presentation that everyone else can understand, then that's okay. And that, that actually, then you have not disclosed it. So you can give a talk and you haven't disclosed it, so you, you, you don't, that, that, that one hour, or I'm sorry, that one year clock has not yet started ticking. Uh, great advice, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I think there was, yeah, there are two questions at the back. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe the lady first, if you don't mind. I would like to follow up about the status quo, the licensing fee, and the connection to that, the license fee. Because I think that was the question. Are they going back to So the question is about what happens with any licensing royalties that come back once we have a license and there's royalties flowing back to the lab based on the invented? Yes. So, so Argonne's policy for that is that there's a, uh, a third, a third, a third split. It's actually 34%, 33%, 33%. 34% uh, actually goes back to the inventors. 33% um, goes back to the ALD office of the inventors uh, you know, that the inventors belong to. Um, and so uh, the, uh, and, then, and then the remaining 33% goes to a fund in the office of the director of the lab. And, uh, you know, royalty money is actually a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of in income source for us because there's a lot of flexibility associated with what you can do with that. Uh, so we try to use that money quite carefully and judiciously. But in things like, uh, you know, that, the, the, the previous question that was just asked around, you know, if you have an interesting idea and you're looking for some additional funding, one source of funds for that kind of activity uh, might actually be the ALD or the divisional royalty uh, base or, or even the OTD royalty funds. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of the OTD royalty funds, for example, are going to support chain reaction innovations, uh, you know, the, the innovator uh, program that we have, uh, lab embedded entrepreneurship program here at the lab. Uh, so we do, we, we try as much as possible to use that money in ways that either grow programs or push uh, inventions out. But a significant portion, 34%, actually goes to the inventors to do what they want with it. <laughs> uh, that's their money. Uh, what, what is the, after the patent trial, how long is So typically, a license will last for the duration of the patents. A patent life is 20 years. Uh, so somewhere along the way, after it has been granted and it continues to age, it actually gets licensed. Uh, once it gets licensed, there's, uh, there may be some sort of an upfront fee. I mean, every license tends to be a little different in terms of numbers, but in general, there's a small upfront fee in the type of stuff that we do. And then there are some diligence commitments. So what we do is when we license it to uh, a company, there is some expectation that they will take that invention and find a way to take it to market. <laughs> and, and usually there are some milestones along the way that shows to us that they are making progress towards taking that invention to market. Uh, so those are diligence commitments. And then at the end, when, when they actually get it to market, there is usually some sort of a royalty that is based on their sales, some unit of their sales. And, and, and then a fraction of that comes back to the lab. Uh, great question. Um, there was a question right next to you, I think. Please. It, it, it actually, so the question is, what happens at the end of life of a patent? And, and, the, the, and the general answer is that it, it is actually in the public domain at that point. Uh, so that particular invention is no longer protected. So anyone can practice it at that point. 
please. I just had one comment, uh, one follow-up. I, I know of one example where um, an inventor made an invention. Um, Argonne made the decision that they were not going to file a patent application. This inventor felt very strongly about it and paid for it themselves. I don't know exactly how that was negotiated, but I, I know it is possible. Right, and, and that is that's exactly right. I just building on what Jeff said, and if that is of interest, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to turn it over to either Mark or Pete to explain that process in detail. Uh, they can help you, or we can do it offline. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so the question is, if, the, uh, if you make a presentation at a quote-unquote non-public forum, for example, a, your annual merit review um, at DOE, uh, does that count as a public disclosure? I'm going to defer to the attorneys. What do the attorneys think? Mark? Thank you, Mark. So just to repeat, <laughs> for uh, the, 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 my general understanding is, you know, is also that if it's, a, if it's a confidential disclosure, then in theory, you're protected. But then you know, how protected are you if someone breaches that confidentiality? What are the consequences? Um, we are in a first to file, and, and Mark will spot, you know, uh, talk a lot more about this in his presentation, but we're in a first to file world. Um, you know, we used to be, you know, it used to be different, but today we're a first to file world. And if we're to, it's in this first to file world, if we can get an invention disclosure into the system, and if we have to get a provisional application in, the provisional application doesn't have to be hugely detailed, but it's one way of, of getting some protection before you actually go out. Um, and you can always abandon the provisional. There's no compulsion that you have to continue that provisional later on if you you know, have no need to, but it gives you some sort of a priority filing date uh, that, that might be valuable. Um, I, I recognize we're just about uh, out of time, but can I ask one last question, Jeff, if you don't mind? Of course. Um, how, do you feel that the invention process and your experience with that has, has uh, either positively or negatively impacted your career at Argonne? Yeah, uh, it's had, a, I think, a very positive impact. So I'll, I'll first mention that uh, you'll note that I drive a Honda, not a Lexus, right? So, <laughs> I mean, if, if you're looking to get rich, you're probably in the wrong place, right? But in terms of enriching your scientific experience, this is a great way to do it. So I think the, the biggest uh, impact, positive impact, is that, um, it, is that um, IP has allowed me and my group to work with companies and do fun and exciting research where it's not just us that's excited about it, the company's excited about it because they want to use that for their business, right? So that, I find that to just be very uh, rewarding. Uh, and you know, companies require that kind of protection because if they're going to invest their own time to, to scale up or whatever, they want to make sure that, uh, that that invention has a patent so that if someone else sues them or whatever, they've, they've got that protection. So, uh, so uh, patents are, are often a requirement uh, to work with a company. Um, uh, and, and so that's why you know, this whole process can be rewarding to us as scientists because then you can, you know, you can work with other organizations. And uh, you know, th there's various things that can happen. They can, uh, they can uh, sponsor research so they can pay you to do 
additional research. Uh, they can, you know, license something. Uh, and even if they don't work with you, I, I still think that's an accomplishment. It's an accomplishment for Argonne because something has gotten out into the real world. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they can also do what's called a, a, a CRADA. It's a type of contract where maybe the DOE is paying you to do research and they're using their own money to do research, but you're working together on a problem, so all, on a project. So all these things, I think, are, are very positive outcomes of uh, the IP process here at Argonne. Yes, thank you. This is, uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for the very informative answers you know, that leverage your experience. I, I, I found it very useful, and I'm sure the others have here, too. So thank you. Thanks so much thank for having me. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think next up is, uh, is Mark Hilliard. Uh, is that right? No, uh, it's, it's Brad Ulrich. Uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, you know, the centers and the strategic outreach function that we talked about in, uh, in, a, in, in the brief introduction that I had with some charts.